Senate Joint Resolution 4, Incorporation of Churches or Religious Denominations Amendment. Third reading of the resolution. The question is on adoption of the resolution. Senator from Morgan. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, the committee substitute for, it's not a committee substitute, SJR 4 would, uh, if, if passed by two-thirds of both houses, lay before the voters of this state the question of whether or not to amend the Constitution of West Virginia, specifically uh, Section 47 of Article 6 of the Constitution, which currently provides that no charter of incorporation shall be granted to any church or religious denomination. That's in our Constitution right now. This would strike uh, those words and include uh, words that say, quote, provisions may also be made by general laws for the incorporation of churches or religious denominations. So, Mr. President, I, I think this is a really interesting one from a, an historical perspective. Um, West Virginia's Constitution has contained that prohibition on the incorporation of churches since the formation of the state in 1863. It comes from the Virginia Constitution. Similar language was in the Constitution of the mother state, the Commonwealth of Virginia. Uh, it is no longer, and there's an interesting, uh, there's an interesting history on it. In uh, 2002, in Virginia, a lawsuit was filed by Jerry Falwell. Uh, the case is Falwell v. Miller, and uh, it's a reported case. It's 203 Federal Supplement 2nd, 6, 624. And it's a 2002 case that comes from the Western District of the United States District Court in Virginia. And the Reverend Jerry Falwell, on behalf of the Thomas Road Baptist Church in Lynchburg, we've all heard of that, uh, sued uh, Clinton Miller, who was at the time the chairman of the State Corporation Commission in Virginia. And I guess that was the office that was sort of the equivalent of our Secretary of State's office here in West Virginia. It's the Secretary of State that handles all corporate charters and the uh, filing of papers and corporation papers. But uh, the suit was filed in federal district court, and the suit alleged that Virginia's constitutional prohibition on churches being able to incorporate violated the First Amendment to the United States Constitution. And in that case, uh, in that case, the United States District Court ruled on summary judgment, I believe it was on a summary judgment, that indeed Virginia's constitutional provisions uh, violated the First Amendment to the United States Constitution. The holding in the case is, um, the General Assembly, the language was, the General Assembly shall not grant a charter of incorporation to any church, et cetera. And the holding of the U.S. District Court was that that provision violated the First Amendment to the United States Constitution. And so the, the epilogue, Mr. President, in Virginia anyway, is after that decision, which was not appealed, I don't think, which uh, Virginia amended its Constitution and did what this resolution before us today would seek to do, take the language out of the Constitution uh, that prohibits incorporation of churches. Uh, after the decision in Virginia, Mr. President, even though that decision was not specifically binding upon West Virginia because it didn't involve the West Virginia Constitution or any church in West Virginia, uh, it was just Virginia, and it was a Virginia district court. Uh, even though uh, there was no legal binding authority by the opinion, from the opinion, upon West Virginia, uh, everyone reading the opinion realized that, you know, our, our constitutional provision is so similar to Virginia's, it would meet the same fate if there were a court challenge in West Virginia. 
And from that point forward, from 2002 or 2003 forward, the Secretary of State's office in West Virginia uh, started granting corporate charters to churches which applied for them, issuing certificates of corporations to churches. And that was, uh, at the time, our current United States Senator, Joe Manchin, he was Secretary of State, uh, and it continued thereafter with uh, Secretary of State Natalie Tennant, through our current Secretary of State, Mac Warner, all of them have granted corporate charters to churches in West Virginia who've applied for them, notwithstanding the fact <laughs> that uh, Section 47 of Article 6 of our Constitution says that it cannot be done. Uh, and I think the thinking, I wouldn't presume to, uh, to know the thinking of the Secretaries of State, but my guess is that they all have read that Thomas Road Baptist Church case and decided West Virginia is in the identical posture, and if somebody challenged our constitutional provision, in federal court, it would meet the same fate as Virginia's. So this resolution simply reverses it and says, takes out the language in our Constitution that says you can't incorporate a church uh, and uh, replaces it with language that says the, the general law of the state may provide for the incorporation of a church uh, if that's what a church wants to do. It doesn't require incorporation, Mr. President, but it leaves it, it would, it would provide it as an option for any church that chose to do that. And our Constitution then would be consistent with the practice that's been ongoing in this state for at least 15 years now of the incorporation of churches who desire to be incorporated. So I'll be happy, Mr. President, to try to answer any questions. Uh, otherwise, I urge the adoption of the resolution. The question is on adoption of the resolution. Is there discussion? Senior Senator from the Fifth. The Senator from Will the Senator Senator yield? yield? Senator Yield. Yes. So let me ask you a question. Say this comes up for vote and the people voted in and a church is considered a corporation. Um, once you're a corporation, you can donate to a campaign, can't you? Uh, no. We disallow uh, corporate campaign donations in West Virginia. And I think if, if a church did that, it would, it would uh, jeopardize its tax-exempt status as well. So you can, so in a corporation, it would be a 501c3 in that respect, or a 501c6 can be active in political activities. Uh, I'm, I don't think so. Uh, and to tell you the truth, there, there have been, as, as we've been told by the Secretary of State in West Virginia, literally hundreds of churches to which, or to whom, the Secretary of State has already granted certificates of incorporation. So I don't know if they have uh, selected a particular designation under 501C of the Internal Revenue Code. I just don't know the answer to that. So 501C3 is um, a nonprofit organization that cannot get engage in any political, political activities. General, my understanding is that that's correct. Generally, charitable organizations uh, to which people can make donations or contributions and get an income tax deduction for their contributions. And a 501c4 is one that's for public good and, you know, cannot receive, can receive donations, but you don't get any, any uh, tax deduction from that. And I, five, I think the senator from Wayne is correct, but I, and I will defer to you on that because I think it's becoming evident that you have a higher degree of knowledge on that question than I do. Only because I've served on so many of these things, I've had to learn about them. Um, the, the, que the I guess so. The question to you is: is and you're saying this could not happen, 
under federal or state laws that um, if they incorporate, then they cannot donate into political campaigns uh, in, in that respect. Yeah, I, I think if a church, and again, I'm not an expert on tax law, I put a disclaimer on my email that you know, says I don't rely on me for tax advice, but I think it would wreck a church's 501c3 status or his charitable donation status if it became involved in donating to like political campaigns. Yeah, I don't think it could do that. All right, thank you. Further discussion? Senator from Raleigh. Thank you, Mr. President. Will the chairman continue to yield, Will the please? the senator yield? The senator yields. Certainly. Let me ask you a few questions here to clarify, because I think a lot of folks across the state maybe are confused when it comes to the fears of church and state interaction. Uh, first of all, is an incorporated church free of government control? Uh, yes, I think so. I don't think a church surrenders its autonomy uh, as, to the government as a result of being incorporated. You know, there is, in our, in our State Bill of Rights, in Article Three of the Constitution, uh, really strong language protecting the autonomy of churches and religious freedom. So would there be any difference in governmental control between a, an incorporated church and a non-incorporated church? I, I don't think so with this one possible exception, and that is, and I don't know if the Secretary of State in what they're doing now applies this to churches, but I do know that corporations, uh, the form in West Virginia, when a, when a corporation gets a charter in West Virginia, there's a filing they have to do annually with the West Virginia Secretary of State. It's, it's an annual report. And I don't know whether the Secretary of State has exempted churches from that or whether they have to file an annual report, same as other corporations, so that would be, as far as I'm thinking, the, I wouldn't consider that, to answer your question, to be governmental control. Will the managing of the church's property still be the sole responsibility of the church itself? Absolutely, yeah. Okay. In accordance with the corporation's articles of incorporation, bylaws, it would, the church would be free to write its own governing structure. So, as my friend from Raleigh knows better than I do, you have uh, small churches that aren't affiliated with a larger denomination uh, that, that have wanted to seek and have sought uh, and have obtained now in West Virginia, notwithstanding our Constitution, status as a corporation. There are many other churches which are not incorporated. And uh, the, the, uh, the big, for instance, the, in the Roman Church, the Roman Catholic Church is governed by a diocese structure. Uh, so is the uh, Church of England, the Episcopal Church. Uh, I'm, I'm familiar with a little bit of the conference structure that the Methodist Church uses, I think all of which uh, do not involve a corporate structure. So just to be totally clear, are churches, is it mandatory that churches be incorporated based on this resolution? Oh, absolutely not. It, this resolution just says uh, that our Constitution should, uh, will permit it. Right now, the Constitution says it can't happen, even though it has been happening uh, for uh, the last 15 years at least in great frequency. Uh, we're making our Constitution uh, consistent with the law as we believe it would be uh, espoused for West Virginia based on the federal case out of Virginia. West Virginia, so far as I know, is the only state left that has, in the whole country, that has a provision like this in its state constitution. One Nothing last. would be mandatory. Churches would be free to incorporate or not, 
And our Constitution would then say that they're free to make their choice about organization and governing structure. Is there anything about incorporation or this resolution that would cause a church to lose their tax exemption and thereby have to pay taxes? No, no. It, it, as the Senator from Wayne pointed out, there might be things a church should do that could cause it to lose a tax exemption, but it's not incorporating. Just by incorporating, there are plenty of corporations, and now in West Virginia, churches which are incorporated, which have a tax exempt status, incorporating would not, incorporating alone would not cause a church to lose its tax exempt status. All right. Thank you, Mr. Pre Mr. Chair. Thank you. Mr. President, can I speak to the resolution? Continue. Uh, the, having been a pastor for 45 years, I understand all of the ins and outs of a church and the incorporated versus unincorporated situation. And this makes it legal from our constitutional viewpoint that church pastors and elders and trustees and deacons, however they are arranged in their hierarchy, as well as the members, will not become personally liable in the event of a lawsuit. And, and so they have the choice as churches to determine whether they want to or not. This is simply doing what uh, all of the rest of the nation, West Virginia is the only state in the nation that does not allow churches to incorporate constitutionally at this point. This is clarifying that. Thank you, Mr. President. And at the appropriate time, I need to uh, give a Rule 43. Is there further discussion? Does Senator from Morgan wish to close? Senator from Greenbrier. Thank you, Mr. President. Pursuant to Rule 43, as a past solo pastor of a small church, I'd like to inquire with you, Mr. President, as to whether or not I should be required to vote. In your response to your inquiry, Chairman rules that you are a member of a class and required to vote. Thank you. Senator, Senior Senator from the 16th. Uh, thank you, Mr. President. As you know, I'm a pastor of a Lutheran church as well as a United Methodist Church and Episcopal priest, and I also ask for a rule, Rule 42 if I'm required to vote. As with the Senator with Greenbrier, in response to your inquiry, Chairman rules that you're a member of a class and required to vote. Senator from Raleigh. Thank you, Mr. President. As a pastor, I would also like to seek a ruling on Rule 43. In your response to the inquiry, Chairman rules that you are a member of class and required to vote. Are there any other pastors that need <laughs> Rule 43? Okay. If not, the question before the Senate is, shall the resolution be adopted? All those in favor will vote, in favor will vote yay. Those opposed will vote nay. The clerk will prepare the machine. Has every member voted? Has every member voted? If so, the clerk will close the machine and ascertain the results. On this question, 32 yeas, zero nays, and two absent not voting. More than two-thirds of those elected to the Senate having voted in the affirmative. I declare the resolution adopted. The clerk will communicate the action of the Senate to the House. Bills on second reading. Committee substitute for Senate Bill 102, allowing disabled veterans and Purple Heart recipi recipients park free at paid parking of state or its political subdivision. Second reading of the bill. Are there amendments to the bill? No, sir. The bill will be engrossed and advanced to third reading. Committee substitute for Senate Bill 356, allowing for a written part of driver's exam given in high school driver's education course. Second reading of the bill. Are there amendments to the bill? No, sir. The bill will be engrossed and advanced to third reading. Committee substitute for Senate Bill 387 relating to drug screening of applicants for cash assistance. Second reading of the bill. Are there amendments to the bill? Yes, sir. Senator Stallings moved to amend the bill on page 1, section 6, line 16 by striking out the word marijuana. Senator from Boone. Thank you, Mr. President. You heard the amendment. Uh, Senator from Boone requests unanimous consent to explain the amendment in lieu of having it read. Is there objection? The chair hears none. Senator from Boone. Thank you, Mr. President. Again, the amendment was read. Uh, it basically strikes out the uh, marijuana from the urine drug screen 
when we're testing for the TANF uh, population. The members of the body knows that there's 30 plus states in West Virginia that have some form of uh, uh, legal marijuana use, whether it's uh, recreational or uh, medicinal. We have one ourselves that's been present for five years, yet it's still not functional. Uh, the uh, urine tends to stay in the, or the urine, the marijuana tends to stay in the urine drug screen for a very long time. So uh, there are easy instances and scenarios where someone would be out of state, do something perfectly legal in that state, come back to West Virginia, a week or two later be tested and uh, be found positive and therefore uh, they uh, would not qualify or would have to uh, enter into a, uh, some type of a treatment formation based on this. Uh, uh, so this just affects this bill here. It doesn't do anything about any other bill as far as urine drug screens for marijuana. Uh, I, uh, it's, we learned that about half of the positive drug screens were marijuana. Just an aside, the three-hour uh, mandatory uh, continuing medical education for us physicians uh, that uh, the last time I took it, the instructor, you know, talked about failed urine drug screens. And again, almost always it is marijuana. This is, this is just to emphasize uh, my point. So the instructor went as far as to say, if you're doing a urine drug screen on someone that's taking, for example, Tylenol number three or hydrocodone or Xanax, don't check for marijuana. That's how far it's come. We know that CBD, uh, very legal, entities uh, cause a false positive marijuana test. And so uh, it's, it just makes sense to me that uh, we would not test for marijuana and I urge adoption of the amendment. Is there discussion? Senator from <laughs> Marshall, forgive me. Thank you, Mr. President. Uh, the, um, we entertained this amendment uh, in the during the committee, the health committee's meeting on this bill. And um, the senator from Boone, who served as chair of the health committee past, has, has some very valid points with, uh, and I agree with many of his points. The will of the committee, we voted this amendment down in the committee, and I stand to oppose it again. Uh, this is a, this was a, um, this, this is not a new bill, okay? This is a uh, extension of a pilot program uh, from, you know, from DHHR who's instituted the pilot program for, it's been three years, they wish to extend it. Uh, prior to the initial approval of the pilot program, we passed the legislation in 2016, I think it was implemented in 2017. Uh, it had to be a federally approved by the uh, U.S. Administration for Children's and Families, so it has federal approval. The fact that 30 states have legalized marijuana, marijuana is illegal federally, it, it's, it, it muddies the waters, it complicates these things, and, uh, uh, you know, but that doesn't change the fact that it uh, currently, recreational use is illegal in West Virginia. Although medical marijuana is passed in West Virginia, uh, it, you know, we've laid an egg with the implementation process uh, as a state so far, and hopefully we, you know, remedy that. Uh, this bill is not, per or this extension of the pilot program is not meant to exclude those in West Virginia that legally have medical, use medical marijuana once it's implemented from getting TANF benefits. That will be addressed when appropriate. That is not the intent. Uh, the intent is to continue the pilot program and I oppose the gentleman's amendment. Further discussion? Senator from Randolph. Mr. President, um, you know, for me, marijuana is probably not the, the greatest thing on our short list of, of uh, issues that we should have to deal with especially related to the drug war. I think we've got a lot of people locked up um, related to marijuana charges that's costing us a lot of money and so on. However, uh, I, I would oppose this amendment because of uh, really a, a, a very basic premise. 
We're talking about people who are getting cash from taxpayers who apparently, the premise is, if they test positive for marijuana, we're apparently paying for their marijuana use. And so I think that we do have a role to say the taxpayers of the state of West Virginia should not be expected to pay for people to use uh, marijuana. Perhaps later on we should address the question of if they're using medical marijuana legally, but this amendment doesn't go that far into that depth. And so I would simply oppose this because I don't think we should be paying for people who are using an illegal substance in most cases. So further discussion. Senator from Harrison. Thank you, Mr. President. Let me start off by saying it's nice to hear a committee chair defending an amendment that was passed by the committee. I want to follow up a little further, though, and say that what about alcohol? Are we testing these folks for alcohol or are we paying for their alcohol with cash assistance? That's kind of a silly premise because what we're not considering is what happens to the children and the other family members because one of the recipients can't pass a drug stream for marijuana. We need to get West Virginia into the 21st century. I mean, we look like we're still living in the 1950s. Recreational marijuana has been passed on the ballot of numerous states. Medical marijuana is legal in numerous states. We have conversations all the time that the feds are on the verge of legalizing marijuana in the next couple of years. Of course, West Virginia is always running years, if not decades, behind the rest of the country, and I'm sure we'll continue to do it on this issue. We ought to put the, the issue on the ballot and be done with it. But to terminate somebody's needed cash assistance, marijuana is not heroin. Marijuana is not opioids. Marijuana is not, which heroin and opioids are the same thing, but marijuana is not crystal meth. It's not going to take every penny out of that person's pocket. If they smoke marijuana, they might be growing it in their backyard or in their basement. It's silly to screen people on this and terminate their benefits because they're using an herb that is used across the world and across this country legally in most instances. They could travel to Colorado, ingest marijuana, come back and be screened for this and lose their benefits. I stand in strong support of the gentleman's amendment. Let's use a little common sense. We're not talking about a dangerous drug here. We're not even testing for alcohol under this. Marijuana should be excluded from this drug screen. Thank you, Mr. President. Further discussion? Senator from Boone, wish to close the debate. Yeah, again, it's, it's just a matter of uh, it, people can move from borders, go into another state, do something perfectly legal, come back home, be tested. Uh, if, if there was a urine drug screen that was sensitive enough to say, is there acute marijuana versus something that happened weeks ago, that would be okay, but there's not. This, this urine drug screen for marijuana is a bad screen. We know that in the healthcare industry. Last year, the uh, judiciary chairman and, and we talked about this. There's so many false positives. And again, we're looking at the poorest of the poor. I don't think we're going to be buying marijuana with uh, the type of uh, money we're talking about here. I didn't get that connection myself. But this is simply to strike marijuana off the urine drug screen. Uh, ultimately, it's going to be done. I'd urge uh, adoption of the amendment. The question before the Senate is adoption of the amendment offered by the Senator from Boone. All those in favor will say aye. aye. Those opposed, no. no. The no's appear to have it. The division's been called. Do a roll call. <laughs> well, roll call's demanded. Is the demand sustained? The demand is sustained. Question for the Senate is adoption of the amendment. All those in favor will vote yay. Those opposed will vote nay. The clerk will prepare the machine. Has every member voted? Has every member voted? If so, the clerk will close the machine and ascertain the results. On this question, 11 yays, 
21 nays and two absent not voting. Less than a majority of those present and voting having voted in the affirmative. I declare the amendment rejected. Are there further amendments? No, sir. The bill will be engrossed in advance to third reading. Bill's on first reading. Senior Senator from the 17th. Thank you, Mr. President. I request unanimous consent that all bills on first reading be considered read a first time and advanced to second reading. Is there objection? Chair hears none. So ordered. Introduction of guest. Remarks by members. Miscellaneous business. Senior Senator from the 17th. Thank you, Mr. President. Our question is consent that a leave of absence be granted for the Senators from Pleasance and Wyoming. Is there objection? Chair hears none. So ordered. Senior Senator from the 17th. Thank you, Mr. President. Subject to announcements, I move the Senate stand adjourned until tomorrow at 11 a.m. Are there announcements? Senator from Morgan. Thank you, Mr. President. Your Committee on the Judiciary will meet today at 3 o'clock p.m. in the Judiciary Committee Room in the West Wing. Senator from Jefferson. Thank you, Mr. President. Your Committee on Education will meet today at 2 p.m. in Room 451M. We will reconvene at 5 p.m. if necessary to complete the day's agenda. Senior Senator from the 4th. Thank you, Mr. President. Your Committee on Finance will meet today at 3 p.m. in 451M. Uh, the agenda has been posted. Senior Senator from the 6th. Thank you, Mr. President. Your Committee on Government Organization will be meeting today at 2 p.m. in Room 208 West. Senator from Marshall. Thank you, Mr. President. Your Committee on Health will meet today, 1 p.m. in 451M. Senator from Tucker. Thank you, Mr. President. Your Committee on Energy will meet today at 1 p.m. At, in 208 West, and the agenda has been posted. Senator from Raleigh. Thank you, Mr. President. Your Committee on the Workforce will meet Wednesday at 10 a.m. in 208 West. The agenda will be posted. Are there further announcements? Senator from Mercer. Thank you, Mr. President. Your Committee on Economic Development will meet tomorrow at 1 p.m. 208 West. Further announcements? Junior Senator from the 17th. Yes, thank you, Mr. President. Your Pension Committee shall meet tomorrow at 3 p.m. in Room 451. The agenda has been posted. Further announcements? If not, the question for the Senate is the Senate stand adjourned until tomorrow at 11 a.m. All those in favor will say aye. Those opposed, no. The ayes appear to have it. The ayes do have it. I declare the Senate adjourned. The House will please be in order. Those persons not having privilege of the floor will please vacate the chamber at this time. Members and guests in the galleries will please rise as we are led in prayer this morning by the lady from the 52nd, Douglas Sipo. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I ask that you join us here this morning as our coach. I ask for your support that you lift our spirits and empower us with grace and forgiveness. You create an atmosphere free from grumbling and complaining. You provide us with the knowledge and an open mind so that we may ask the right questions and make the right decisions, that we successfully fulfill the purpose that we were sent here to do by the people of our home communities. But more importantly, that at the end of the day, when the votes have been cast, I pray that they are the ones that will have your blessings. Please kindly watch over and protect our loved ones back home and all those in need that only you know of. All of this we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. If members of guests will please remain standing, we'll be led in the Pledge of Allegiance by the German, the 22nd, Doug at Maynard. Will everybody please stand as we honor our flag? I pledge allegiance, allegiance to, to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Members of guests may be seated. Reading of the journal. Journal of the House of Delegates, Charleston, March 1st, 2021. Gentlemen, the 50th, Doug at Mallow. Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent that the further reading of the journal be dispensed with 
and that it be approved as having been read. The Journal of the 50th, Ash Dennis, consent that further reading of the journal be dispensed with and it be approved as having been read. Are there objections? The chair hears no objections. Reading the journal is dispensed with. Lady from the 49th. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move subject to announcements. The House stand in recess for five minutes. Are there announcements? Lady from the 49th. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Your committee on rules will meet behind the chamber immediately. Question before the House is a motion that the House stand in recess for five minutes. Those in favor, please say aye. Suppose please say no. The ayes have it. The motion is adopted. The House is in recess for five minutes.
House will return to order. Lady from the 49th for an update on the calendar. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. On special calendar second reading, Senate Bill 277 has been transferred to the House calendar. On House calendar third reading, committee substitute for Senate Bill 11 and third reading and HJR 2 third reading have been transferred to the special calendar. Introduction of guests, Lady from the 49th. Our doctor of the day is Dr. Ben Wayneblatt from Huntington, if we will please make him welcome. Report to standing committees. Your Committee on Government Organization has had under consideration House Bill 2621, mandating certification for certain members of fire departments, require certain types of training, allowed specialized personnel who are not firefighters to be members of a department and require the postings of fire department evaluations. Reports back to committee substitute, therefore, with the recommendation that the committee substitute do pass. That report will be received. Your Committee on Government Organization has had under consideration House Bill 2699 authorize the workforce West Virginia to hire additional employees to serve at the Commissioner's will and pleasure. Reports back committee substitute, therefore, with the recommendation that the committee substitute do pass that it be referred to the Committee on Finance. The report will be received. The bill will be referred to the Committee on Finance. Your Committee on Government Organization has had under consideration Committee substitute for Senate Bill 270, providing for tax collect, providing for collection of tax by hotel marketplace facilitators, reports the same back with recommendation that it do pass. The report will be received. Your Committee on Judiciary has had under consideration House Bill 2741, relating to expansion of the alcohol test and lock program to offenders with a drug-related offense, reports the same back with recommendation that it do pass. That report will be received. Your Committee on Judiciary has had under consideration House Bill 2257 relating to extended supervision for certain drug offenders and House Bill 2507 remove the limitations on advertising and promotional activities by limited video lottery retailers and House Bill 2675 relating to costs and interest in eminent domain condemnation proceedings reports back committee substitutes, therefore, with the recommendation that the committee substitutes each two pass. The report will be received. Your Committee on Finance has had in consideration committee substitute for House Bill 2013 relating to the HOPE Scholarship Program reports the same back with amendment with the recommendation that it do pass the as amended. The report will be received. Are there further reports to stay in the committees? Yeah. If not, reports of select committees. Message from the executive. Message from the Senate. The clerk of the Senate announced the Senate has passed with amendment House Bill 2262 relating to the Controlled Substance Monitoring Database. That report will be received. Lady from the 49th. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Relating to House Bill 2262, if you would like to follow along since we have the new system, you go to the delegate console system and you hit bulletin board, and then from there uh, you can see House actions on Senate messages. The purpose of this bill is to change who shall report and review the cold, controlled substance monitoring database. The Senate amendment fixes incorrect code citations to ensure the reader will accurately and quickly find the correct code section that is referenced. Therefore, Mr. Speaker, I move the House concur with the Senate amendment. The question before the House is a motion by the lady from the 49th that the House concur in the Senate amendments to House Bill 2262. Is there discussion on the motion? 
If not, those in favor of the motion will please say aye. aye. Those opposed will please say no. The ayes have it. The motion is adopted. Clerk, chair declares the motion adopted. Clerk will read the bill a third time. House Bill 2262 relating to the Controlled Substance Monitoring Database. The question before the House is the passage of the bill as amended by the Senate and concurred in by the House. Is there discussion on the bill? If not, those in favor of the bill will vote aye. Those opposed will vote no. The clerk will prepare the machine. Has every member voted? If so, the clerk will close the machine and ascertain the result. On that question, there were 99 ayes, zero nays, and one member absent not voting. A majority of members having voted in the affirmative, the chair declares the bill passed. The clerk will please report the title. House Bill 2262, relating to the Controlled Substance Monitoring Database. Are there amendments to the title? If not, the title is read by the clerk will be and remain the title of the bill. The clerk will please communicate the action of the House to the Senate. Next Senate message. The Senate has passed Senate Bill 16, providing continued eligibility for development, developmental disability services to dependents of military members. The message will be received. The bill will be referred to the Committee on Veterans Affairs and Homeland Security, then the Committee on Finance. The Senate has passed Committee Substitute for Senate Bill 53, providing person criminally responsible for another's death may not be involved in burial arrangements. The message will be received. The bill will be referred to the Committee on Judiciary. The Senate has passed Senate Bill 308, modifying the requirement that Racetrack participate in West Virginia Thoroughbred Development Fund by certain date. The message will be received. The bill will be referred to the Committee on Finance. The Senate has passed Committee Substitute for Senate Bill 321, clarifying and updating language regarding Fairmont State Alumni License Plates. The message will be received. The bill will be referred to the Committee on Technology and Infrastructure, then the Committee on Judiciary. The Senate has passed Senate Bill 338, creating Fire Service Equipment and Training Fund. The message will be received. The bill will be referred to the Committee on Fire Departments and Emergency Medical Services, then the Committee on Finance. The Senate has passed Senate Bill 358, removing prohibition on ATMs located in an area where racetrack video lottery machines are located. The message will be received. Lady from the 49th. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I ask unanimous consent that the bill be taken up for immediate consideration and dispense with the committee reference. The lady from the 49th asked unanimous consent that Senate Bill 358 be taken up for immediate consideration and the committee reference dispense with. Is there objection? The chair hears no objection. The committee reference for Senate Bill 358 shall be dispensed with. Next Senate message. The Senate has passed Senate Bill 374, increasing threshold for a bid requirement to $10,000 to be consistent with other state agencies. The message will be received. The bill will be referred to the Committee on Government Organization. The Senate has passed Committee Substitute for Senate Bill 377, relating to extension for boil water advisories by water utility or public service district. The message will be received. The bill will be referred to the Committee on Health and Human Resources, then the Committee on Judiciary. Are there further measures from the Senate, if not resolutions? House Concurrent Resolution 17, James C. Vickers, Silver Star Highway. Lady in the 49th. Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent that the further reading of resolutions introduced be dispensed with and that each resolution be considered as formally introduced and referred to the appropriate committees as indicated on the delegate console system. The lady from the 49th asked unanimous consent that further reading of resolutions introduced be dispensed with and that each resolution be considered as having been formally introduced and referred to the appropriate committees as shown on the delegate console system. Are there objections? There are no objections. Petitions, motions. Bills introduced. House Bill 2814, Election Security Access and Modernization Act of 2021. Lady from the 49th. Mr. Speaker, I ask unanimous consent that the further reading of bills introduced be dispensed with and that each bill be considered as formally introduced and referred to the appropriate committees as indicated on the delegate console system. The lady from the 49th ask unanimous consent that further reading of bills introduced be dispensed with and that each bill be considered as having been formally introduced and referred to the appropriate committees as shown on the delegate console system. Are there objections? There are no objections. Unfinished business, bills on third reading. Committee substitute for Senate Bill 11, declaring work stoppage or a strike by public employees be unlawful. The gentleman of the 27th, Ellington, to explain the bill. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
Committee sub uh, Senate Bill 11, declaring work stoppage or strike by public employees to be unlawful. Uh, Mr. Speaker, what this bill, as amended by the House, does, it includes a declaration that any work stoppage or strike by public employees is unlawful based on a ruling of the West Virginia Supreme Court. It provides the conditions for when a County Board of Education employee is considered to be participating in a work stoppage or strike. It prohibits accrued and equivalent instructional time and the delivery of instruction through alternative methods from being used to cancel days that are lost due to a concerted work stoppage and strike. It also prohibits the State Board from granting a waiver to a County Board for its non-compliance with the 200-day minimum employment term or the 180-day minimum instructional term requirements if the non-compliance is the result of a concerted work stoppage or strike. It makes a determination that participation in a concerted work stoppage or strike is grounds for termination. And it also provides that if an employee remains employed by the county board, notwithstanding his or her participation in a concerted work stoppage or strike, the county board is required to withhold the prorated salary or hourly pay for each day that the employee participates and requires the sums to be forfeited to the county board. Mr. Speaker, that's the bill, and I urge passage. Question before the House is shall the bill pass? Are the members who wish to speak to passage of the bill? The gentleman from the 67th, Doug Doyle, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, I oppose this bill uh, in part because of uh, the accurate information portrayed to us by the chairman of the Education Committee. This is already illegal. Our courts have said so. We don't need to. Are there other members who wish to speak to passage of the bill? The gentleman from the 26th, Doug Evans, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Uh, under this bill, superintendents will no longer be able to close schools in the anticipation of a teacher work stoppage or strike, whatever you want to call it. So the kids will what? Come to school anyway? And the principal, I guess, will be there to take care of them. What are the odds? 300 to 1? That's some great supervision, isn't it? Who's going to take care of your kids? Do you think the teachers really won't continue to strike because of this bill? If it's bad enough, they'll do it. I walked that line in 1990. I had to. I couldn't feed my family. Other teachers did too because of the same reasons. I require, remember our, our, our uh, Board of Education had come attending a rally. They donated their salaries to the strike cause. Are the local boards really going to fire their teachers? Come on. They're not. They can't find them now. They go to church with those teachers. They live in the same community with them. Ladies and gentlemen, we already have it in law already. It's against the law to do it. But they did it anyway. And they'll do it again regardless if we pass this bill if it's bad enough. We're doubling down on them. So let's just call this what it is, a threat. It's a threat. That's what this bill is to the teachers and the public employees. You know, uh, I walk those, those lines and I walk them again. I'll be right there with them when it, when it gets bad enough and, we have, and they have to do it. Let's quit threatening our teachers. Let's do something for them. I sat in a meeting the other day with four people. I won't tell you about it, but I did. And a gentleman said, we need something that makes a difference. Does this make a difference? How about a nice bill that does something for discipline? So our teachers don't have the problems that they have, and we're able to hire teachers. Ladies and gentlemen, we don't need this bill. I'm against it, and I ask you to be against it too. I ask you to vote no with me. The gentleman, the 43rd, Doug Thompson is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. 
I'm speaking against this bill as well. Uh, this has been a very interesting uh, three years. In 2018, I was one of those teachers on the picket line, and I was one of those teachers that were down here in those galleries. And then in 2019, I was sitting in this seat. The previous two work stoppages that we had, the teachers and the service personnel of this state made sure that every kid was fed. We got food ready, we delivered food. We had stations where kids could come and be uh, supervised in community centers. In the, in the, those two work stoppages, we still made sure we had 180 days of instruction and 200 days of employment. And then we were told that this is, we're going to make sure that this is grounds for termination. Didn't we just pass a bill a few days ago saying anyone with a bachelor's degree can be a teacher now? We can't find teachers, so we're going to make it, you know, this makes no sense. Terminate. My friend from McDowell, his comments, so it's just, I want to reiterate that. It, it makes no sense. These are members of our community. We go to church with them. We see them at the doctor's office. We see them uh, at our kids' games. We're not going to do that. This is just a purely retaliatory and punitive bill meant to punish our teachers and our service personnel of this state for doing what's right and standing up for what's right. And I urge you guys to think about this and hit the no button. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The gentleman number 36, Doug Barrick, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would the chairman yield for a question? Yes, sir. Uh, yeah, I'm just uh, uh, seeing this, that uh, striking would become grounds for termination. So if we had a repeat of the 2018 strike, would that mean every teacher would be, would be terminated? The ones that, that would be grounds for the ones that did strike would, could be terminated, yes. So if everybody walked out, we're going to have to... Well, you said everybody. If people showed up at work, they wouldn't be terminated. Okay. But if they all did, they'd all be gone, and we'd have to put out an ad for 20,000 teachers for Monday. Uh, okay. Right. It, it doesn't say they have to be fired. It just says that's grounds for being fired. Right. And my concern about that is that... Um, uh, it, is that it's grounds for, that means on an individual basis, and I just wonder if that would make it so, uh, give uh, uh, maybe school boards or administrators uh, a chance to kind of look over and round up the usual suspects and say, these are the instigators, we're going to get rid of them. And I just wonder if it could be handed out I I un unfairly. Yeah, this doesn't say that, but I would imagine that's up to the state, I mean to the uh, local uh, superintendent. I, I think that's a real concern. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Speaker, may I, may I uh, speak to the bill? The gentleman is recognized. Uh, yes, well, I I'm definitely against this as well. Um, you know, uh, public, public strikes are, uh, teacher strikes are not something that's plaguing the country. I mean, it's not like we have five states that are out on strike right now and another ten considering it. And uh, people don't want to go on. I've been a member of uh, a two-time union member, and people don't want to go on strike, believe me. I, I've been in a situation where we've considered a strike, and you do everything you can uh, because people can't take the time off without an income. And I think, I, I just think as, as a body I, I, and as a state, I think we should kind of alter our way of thinking and say, instead of being punitive on anyone that wants to strike, how about going to the bargaining table in good faith and saying, you know, people are, are, teachers aren't asking for a lot here, believe me, and they're not getting it. We're 49th in the state, in the nation, uh, with our teacher salaries, uh, uh, once again ahead of Mississippi, and again, both of us are 49 and 50 in our education system, so that, that's probably not a coincidence. But I'm just saying, let, let's, let's just uh, give our public employees what they need. Uh, people don't ask for a lot, they want a livable wage. They want decent benefits, they want good working conditions, and a little respect. And I don't think that's too much to, to give. And, and instead of being punitive, let's reach out and give a little love to our public employees and uh, keep them on the job that way. Thank you very much. The lady in the 51st, like a flesh hour is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, and hello, everyone. Happy Tuesday. It's sort of hard to keep them straight anymore. I want to make three points. Uh, one, uh, we all took an oath of office to uphold the Constitution. And as most of you know, the Constitution takes precedence over our laws. That is what guides us. And I, I want to talk about 
uh, a provision that a lot of people aren't very familiar with. It's Article 3, which is our Bill of Rights. Article 3, Section 16, it says the right of public assembly held inviolate. And it says, uh, in, it's just one sentence, the right of the people to assemble in a peaceable manner, to consult for the common good, to instruct their representatives, which is the part I think is very interesting, or to apply for redress of grievances shall be held inviolate. Some of you know that I was chair of constitutional revision for 18 years. Um, if you look up the word inviolate, it means basically cannot be violated. And it's my opinion that if teachers and school personnel come here to communicate with us, they are exercising their constitutional rights under this provision of our Constitution. They are assembling peaceably, they're consulting for the common good, and they're instructing us that they don't feel like they have a reasonable wage, that they need grievances that need to be addressed. So I think that they have, I think this uh, legislation is ill-founded, and uh, I think the teachers, our founders who wrote this Constitution had a pretty valuable point that they wanted the people to be in charge. Secondly, I'd like to make the point again that I made the other day about timing. What a terrible time to pass this bill, right in the middle of a pandemic. Have any of you ever tried to teach a class live and also Zoom at the same time? Our teachers are there for our children and our grandchildren. They are tearing their hair out trying to not leave any child behind during this horrible pandemic. I think this is bad timing bad policy, and possibly unconstitutional, and I'm going to be voting no, I urge you to do the same. The gentleman of the 27th, Elgar Ellington, wish to close debate on the bill? Other, other, members, are, yes, other members are seeking recognition, are now seeking recognition. Please, please ring in if you do seek to be recognized. The gentleman of the 16th, Elgar Hornbuck, was recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. To my colleagues today, I stand before you to talk about this bill and what it means to all of our great West Virginians. A work stoppage refers to the temporary cessation of work as a form of protest and can be initiated by either the employees or company management. When initiated by employees, work stoppages refer to a single employee or group of employees ceasing work purposefully as a means of protest. Now, all of us here in this great state, we understand what the work stoppage was about. We know that there was many promises by what is now the minority party, the Democrats. We didn't come through. 2014, Republicans took over, a whole heap of other promises didn't come through. So we all share this. But PEIA, mere notion of respect, and compensation, we know what they were stopping for. We come down here and we beg and plead, and I think all 100 of us does, for middle America to make sure one can have a good, honest living. And right that, we have not afforded them that. We've stepped on them at every single turn. That's what we've done. But in this body, we have the wherewithal to correct that, the transgressions of our past. And I know earlier this session, you know, in a couple of these education bills, I asked what are we doing, but I think I know it's clear what we're doing right now. We're poking our fingers in the eye of public educators. You know, 
<laughs> you don't have to worry about a man who doesn't forget where he came from. August 1912, we have the most beautiful capital in all of the states. And right there on those front steps, Mother Jones spoke to us and about unfair wages and, and conditions that they were going through in the mines. This is deeper than teachers. Don't forget where you came from. We like to have celebrations. You know, today's the second day of March, women's history. We're going to celebrate that. But also 100 years ago, <laughs> Blair Mountain, Mate One, Logan, MacDowell, 100 years ago. We just sat in here last week, and we applauded for keeping the lights on. We're a coal. That's what we did. We clapped. But are you just doing that for show? Because if you cared about those coal miners and those teachers, something that's already illegal, this is for show. They have paved the way for all hundred of us in here, and it would not have happened if it wasn't simply for work stoppages to fight for that pay, to fight for integrity respect, to be able to go home, put food on the table for all those West Virginians. So as we leave here today, and after we make that vote, and I know that most of your minds are made up, but I'm also going to implore that you think this one out, and you think about those teachers, but also think about those coal miners and all those other proud West Virginians that have paved the way for us. I urge you to vote no. Thank you. The gentleman of the third, Doug Fluhar, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I rise today in support, in support, Mrs. Gardell, Nurse Jones, Mrs. Clark, my mom, my grandmother, my colleagues, Mr. Thompson, Mr. Evans, Mr. Pethel and the thousands of educators and school service personnel who came before them. Because obviously we need a few more to come back to the Capitol, maybe give us a history lesson. We've clearly forgotten where we come from. Three teacher strikes, each one a profile in courage compared to the profiles and cowardice we have here today by the legislature. Three of them. Three strikes do not require legislation to punish them. It requires a legislature to care about them. Give them reasons not to come here. Reinforce the motto you guys always talk about on the other side. I recall when they came down, and a gentleman touched on it earlier, they're, what they're wearing, wearing red, symbolic of the Battle of Blair Mountain. Because it was clear our educators and school service personnel weren't here for just them. They were here for our history. They were here for every coal miner that came before them, every blue collar worker that came before them because this state was built on the foundation from a labor crisis. And we came together. Could you imagine being a legislator after the Battle of Blair Mountain, walking in here, putting a bill up, declaring work stoppage or strike by coal miners to be unlawful? Could you imagine that? How would you feel? should feel no differently today because it's embarrassing. It's not who we are. Just pointing fingers and blaming educators when the reality is it's a we problem, guys. It's a legislative problem. Our response should be to correct the reasons why work stoppages occur, not to punish them for happening. And that's what we're doing today. And that motto I mentioned earlier, earlier you guys always talk about. It's good. People remember it live, work, and raise a family. I'm just wondering, in what state? Certainly not here. Change, live, to leave. Is that all you're doing? You're forcing people out. We want them to stay, rebuild, and succeed in this state. And that's why I'll be voting no, Mr. Speaker. The lady from the 51st, Doug Walker, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. May I speak to the bill? The lady is recognized. 
Thank you. We all want to press our green or red buttons, but I want to bring something to you, an African proverb. Each one teach one. This proverb was adopted, it was elevated, doing a part of our history that we don't want to acknowledge slavery. It was around education, where slaves were prohibited, especially to read. What we've seen in 2018 was something phenomenal. The phrases of don't make us go West Virginia ripped all across the United States. Now some of us seen that as an embarrassment. Some of us seen it as an abuse and neglect because how dare educators and personnel walk out? Well, I was only on the ballot at that time, but I say, how dare elected officials let it get to that point of no health care, not having your neighbors back as they sit in the classroom without the trainings that they need, no real discipline from our State Department of Education, no food in the mouths of these children, but we want them to sit in a classroom and learn. You know, West Virginia, a place to live, work in, raise a family if you choose or forced to. Local control is something that I heard so often in 2019. We want them to have local control. We want local control. And all of a sudden in 2021, we are ripping away local control. So is red turning blue or blue turning red? Or are we just a mixture of purple or confusion? Because there is no black and white, but there's a whole bunch of gray areas. The songs we heard and the chants we heard from out in the great hall, show me what democracy looks like. This is what democracy looks like. 55 united, 55 strong. And looks like this year, we're trying to break them. We're putting gags in the mouths of our educators, you know, the ones who feed our children and have a couch in the classroom closets so they can talk to them about the abuse in their homes or so they can sit and change their clothes because there is no water or electricity. They're living in their vehicles. It's those educators who we were so proudly to promote as we go through the pandemic when they were helping our food pantries to make sure that their families and their students' families were fed. You may see it as an apple or a bag lunch. Those educators see it as an investment to our future leaders. We can't get anyone to stay here because we keep kicking them out. We don't even worry about the bootstraps anymore because we just gonna rip it all apart. Strike, a refusal to work organized by a body of employees as a form of protest, typically in an attempt to gain a concession or concessions from their employer. Right outside on the Capitol steps, you had educators to say that they work across the border, that they receive SNAP benefits. Their families are even eligible for Medicaid. And if that don't make you feel like if that just don't make you feel. I'm not here to judge what you should feel like. These people work overtime. They don't complain. They work more than the hours a day than they sit in that classroom. They don't complain. But yet and still, we continue to punish them and think less of them. We disrespect them. We degrade them, we dehumanize them, and we weaponize against them. Because unlike us, they can't stand in unity and solidarity. 
So what are we gonna do? I guess vote green for a state of ignorance. I vote red to stay, rebuild, and succeed in West Virginia. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The gentleman at 27, Doug Ellington, to close debate on the bill. Yes, Mr. Speaker, thank you. Uh, despite reasons or rationale for previous strikes, and that doesn't necessarily mean teachers or personnel, it's all public employees. There have been strikes before in the past, Department of Highways, for example. I mean, these are any of our public employees with the state. It's illegal to do so. So despite the reasons or the rationale for it, that has nothing to do with this. The right to assemble peaceably or to redress government about their, their grievances of First Amendment rights, this doesn't stop that. It just says you're not going to do it during your regular work time. You can do that any time outside of that. We're not impeding that. For those that are current in the current situation, those that do strike still get paid. Conditions in this bill changes that. It says if you go on strike, you're not going to get paid for that time. I don't think too many people could argue with that. The other part this does is says that those five extra instructional days that we authorize for them to make up minutes for late starts or early, de early uh, departures from school was intended to help stay within that 100-day instructional time, not for strikes. So those are only two conditions that are in here. It just says they will not get paid. It still states that it's a condition that they could be fired, but it also says that we're not going to use those extra instructional days to make up time for a strike. That's all it does. It's not targeting one group or another. It's just all public employees have the same thing. Now, we know what happened in the past couple of years, especially with our teacher strike. Between those two years and then also with COVID, it's our uh, students have really suffered on education. That's just an example. But what if we have other things shut down in the state? That's really going to affect the way this state operates. So uh, this is just stating the obvious. It's just putting in these extra things. And uh, the part with the instructional time does affect the education system, per se, but I don't think that's unreasonable. So uh, I would urge passage of this bill based on those objections. The question before the House is, shall the bill pass? Those members in favor of passage will vote aye. Those opposed will vote no. The clerk will prepare the machine. Has every member voted? If so, the clerk will close the machine and ascertain the result. On that question, there were 53 ayes, 46 nays, and one member absent not voting. Majority of members voting in the affirmative. Chair declares the bill passed. The clerk will please report the title. Committee substitute for Senate Bill 11, declaring work stoppage or strike by public employees to be unlawful. Are there amendments to the title? If not, the title as read by the clerk will be and remain the title of the bill. The clerk will please communicate the action of the House to the Senate. Next item on third reading. <coughs> House Joint Resolution 2, providing that courts have no authority or jurisdiction to intercede or intervene in or interfere with any impeachment proceedings of the House of Delegates or the Senate. The gentleman of 35th, Dr. Capito, to explain the resolution. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker, and good morning, everybody. The resolution before you seeks to confirm in the West Virginia Constitution the well-established federal principle that there is no judicial review of impeachment. I'll take some of you back that were part of this chamber in the summer and spring of 2017 when we were brought back into session by call of the governor to look into some of the uh, occurrences that were happening in the East Wing with the Supreme Court. And those of you who weren't here, I'm sure if you were in the state of West Virginia, you recall that being a heavy part of the news cycle. The Judiciary Committee worked all summer of 17 to investigate uh, some of the misdeeds that were occurring and the cavalier spending and outrageous conduct that occurred by our Supreme Court, and spent hours and hours on end with staff and members taking time out of their personal lives to take their job as a legislator seriously. In 2018, that committee reported to this full body its findings. 
And unfortunately, sometimes in this body, as we all like to look forward, sometimes we have to look back to correct th things that were done in the structure of government to ensure that going forward, things are as they should be. And in 2018, unfortunately, this body uh, approved and adopted articles of impeachment on four Supreme Court justices, all of the existing Supreme Court justices at the time. It was a sad day for West Virginia. I remember sitting right over there uh, where the gentleman from the 48th sits now and uh, wondering where we kind of go from here, because everybody was a little bit down. And then a Supreme Court case happened, a challenge as these articles of impeachment were delivered to our, our other uh, colleagues over in the Senate to put on a trial as the Constitution says that we are to do as a legislative body. And one of those justices was acquitted. And when the next article was brought before that body, there was a stay that was issued by our Supreme Court, by a substitute Supreme Court, by a court that was appointed by the individuals or by the body in the department that was actually under review. It really pushed the limits of separation of powers in West Virginia. The very foundational concept of this republic, separation of powers. And that substitute court issued an opinion that rendered our findings in this body moot. And with that, we were essentially in this body defanged from one of our constitutional responsibilities. And so I give that background only to say that I wish I wasn't standing here today to present this House Joint Resolution to you because I believe the reading of our Constitution to be clear. And I believe it to be the province of this body, the sole, as our Constitution says, sole responsibility of the House of Delegates to uh, deliver articles of impeachment. And so this resolution clarifies even more unambiguously that no other branch of government has any jurisdiction to tell the legislative branch of government what it can and cannot do as it relates to impeachment. So as we learned a couple weeks ago, I feel like we've had a lot of good government and structural bills, and we've had good robust debate. And I think the, one of the most important things that we're doing here is we are bringing balance back to the separation of power. And it's not selfish for us to assert our responsibility. I would argue that it's our duty as legislators to assert our responsibility to the voters that put us here because we are accountable to them. So ladies and gentlemen, the resolution adopts the federal standard that it, is, that it is the province of this branch to handle all impeachment proceedings. It clarifies and puts new language in the Constitution, which is very serious, and requires a two-thirds majority of this body to adopt, and that body to adopt, and then to go before all of our constituents to vote, to then put as a permanent part of our Constitution something that we already knew. Again, it's unfortunate that I stand before you today, but it is incredibly necessary that this step is taken so that we assert ourselves to the people of West Virginia. Mr. Speaker, I'm happy to take questions on the resolution. The gentleman at 36, Dr. Rowe, is recognized. Yes, if, if you would take some questions, sir. Sure. I'm having trouble remembering uh, exactly what the Supreme Court said in overturning our impeachment process. My recollection is that they found that we didn't abide by our own rules and we impeached the whole court in one fell swoop and did not individually address impeachment of each member. No? Wrong? Well, uh, if I may, uh, so I think the finding of the court in essence stated that we didn't follow our own rules. Right. But my assertion to that or my argument to that is, is that it's not a, impeachment proceedings are not a criminal, they're not a civil, and they're not a judicial proceeding, they're a political proceeding uh, that is laid out in the Constitution. And I would submit to you that the only arbiter of whether those rules were followed or not are the would be the gentleman sitting at the chair at the time. So what the court said was that we didn't follow the procedure that we laid out for ourselves and therefore our proceedings were flawed.
We didn't make findings of fact according to the Workman v. Carmichael decision. Well, the, the, the court, though, makes decisions about whether we abide by the rules and whether we uh, uh, comply with the Constitution all the time. Our rulemaking procedure was found unconstitutional because we would vote, if we didn't act on a rule, then it would be automatically voided. And Supreme Court said, you can't do that. You know, you've, you've got to act, you've got to be a legislature. You can't have a couple committees just kill a bill and then have rules be killed with it. You've got to act as a legislature. And so what you do is you legislate. So if you want to amend a rules bill, or if you want to, to kill a rules bill, you've got to pass a bill doing that. And you say, well, but that's our, we should be able to decide what to do. Yeah, but the Supreme Court decides those kinds of issues all the time, particularly procedural issues. I mean, isn't that the case that we're, I mean, we have the Supreme Court looking at, at our bills, whether they address two objects. Uh, there's any number of things that, that the Supreme Court looks at, and, and this is really just one of those, is it not? Well, I would submit to you that uh, the Supreme Court absolutely reviews and has judicial review on any law that's passed here, but we're talking about what the Constitution states. I don't think there was any confusion as to whether the, uh, the legislative branch had, has the power of impeachment. Quite frankly, I think, that they, uh, I think that the substitute court was looking for an out and tried to find a procedural, some procedural wiggle room to kind of stay, a, to stay the decision. And, and I say that only because, as we've seen t in today's world, uh, if I may, we look to Washington, and unfortunately, the events that have happened there, we've seen our second federal impeachment proceeding of the same, well, of the president and then of a former president for the first time ever. And I would submit to you and the whole body that the, that the Supreme Court, the United States Supreme Court, their restraint from taking a position on whether or not that was constitutional is proof, further proof, that the Judicial Department has no place at all, full stop, in impeachment proceedings. Well, I think that, that what you're talking about as the example in the, in the, the federal government is the fact that the, the body gets to make decisions about what their jurisdiction is and how they should proceed. But the issue was not there presented about whenever we have an established impeachment procedure that's been used in West Virginia and we didn't follow it. Now, is it, is it also not correct that the Supreme Court in making the decision did not forbid us from doing it properly? That we weren't, we weren't prevented from having the Senate send it back over to us and we do it with individual impeachments of individual members. I mean, we could have fixed it without changing the Constitution. And, and the point is always important that when people's constitutional rights are involved, uh, they have to be uh, considered and treated fairly. And all the court said was, that, look, you, you didn't take a vote on each individual person. You took a vote on everybody together. And that was wrong. Now, that's my, I haven't read the case recently, so if I'm wrong on that, please correct me. But I, I think it's very important that we understand that the Supreme Court did not take over our impeachment process. The Supreme Court said, if you're going to do it, you've got to do it right. Gentlemen, we'll state the point. I believe the gentleman recognized to ask questions of the chairman, not to speak on the bill. Well, the gentleman does have the floor. If the gentleman is, is concluded asking questions, the chair, will, or the chair will ask the chairman to sit and recognize the gentleman to then speak. Is the gentleman concluded? Yeah, I, I, I'm concluded with my questions, yes, okay. and I apologize if I The point is well taken. Far. The gentleman is now recognized to speak. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. I, I think that, that we need to understand the difference about what we're talking here. We're talking about if you're going to impeach people, you've got to do it by your rules. You got to be fair. The people who are impeached have to know what the procedures are. They not have to know whether they have to defend the entire Supreme Court or just themselves. I mean, these are very fundamental rights of due process. This is what our country is about. 
It's very important that when you're accused of something, that you know what you're accused of and you know how you're supposed to defend it. In our impeachment proceedings, we didn't do that. We put the whole court in and sent it over to the Senate. We could have backed it up. You know, we have bills and, and we, could, we can reconsider and back up and, and, and clean up the procedure. We could have responded to the court in that way. And there was a decision, basically, maybe by default, there was a decision that we would not back up and do the impeachment. And you say, well, why? Well, we had, I think, one justice resigned. No, maybe two justices resigned. And the situation kind of resolved itself in an informal way by settlement. And, uh, you know, I, I think that probably the outcome was appropriate. One thing I think the court probably was sending a message on is you don't impeach the entire Supreme Court. You impeach individuals who have abused their authority. And you do it one at a time. Now, the court's decision was correct. We made a mistake. We didn't follow our rules and our regulations. We got rid of the whole court in one fell swoop. And the Supreme Court said, you can't do that. This is an action not against the Supreme Court, not against your equal branch. This is an action against people who have abused their authority. And if that's the contention and that's the charge, then prove it individually as to each person who's to be impeached. And then vote on them one at a time and decide whether they need to be impeached. This is not a bill. This is a resolution to change the Constitution of West Virginia to say that the Supreme Court has absolutely no control, no interest, no, no protection uh, to be provided to individuals who may be subject to impeachment. It goes, it, the reach is just, uh, there is, there's no limit to the reach of what this, what this constitutional amendment would do. I encourage the members to vote against this, this resolution. It, it uh, changes the Constitution in a way that really, when we look at it, we don't want it changed, especially on the facts of this case, which was we didn't get it right, we could have fixed it, we didn't. It took care of itself essentially on settlements with individual judges, and life went on without us taking over the Supreme Court, which is our equal branch. I would encourage the members to vote against the resolution. The lady with 51st, Dr. Flesher, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I rise again to talk about our Constitution, which is a document that I think we should all be very, very proud of. And um, I uh, disagreed with our actions on impeaching an entire branch of government, uh, strongly disagreed with that, that um, it would be, you know, as if every single member of the legislature could be impeached by charging us all. Um, I, I thought we were way, way over the bounds of what I think is proper. But I think we also, this particular I mean, it would be as if Congress decided to impeach the entire Supreme, U.S. Supreme Court at once. I don't think that that would go unnoticed. But what are we talking about changing? What will, what will we be, we will be changing at least two provisions by adopting this change to the Constitution. One would be the division of powers section, which is Article 5, Section 1, which is one sentence. The legislat le legislative, executive, and judicial departments shall be separate and distinct so that neither shall exercise the powers properly belonging to either of the others, nor shall any person exercise the powers of more than one of them at the same time, except that justices of the peace shall be eligible to the legislature. Well, that isn't relevant anymore. So what this would do would say that there is no, that the, it's, that there is, that the, there's no constitutional restraint whatsoever on impeachment. That's what this would say, and that the separation of powers is not relevant. Secondly, we also have a provision in our Constitution. It's in Article 3, the part I was reading from earlier 
which is our Bill of Rights, and that says, the courts of the state shall be open, and every person for an injury done to him and his person, property, or reputation shall have remedy by due course of law, and justice shall be administered without sale or delay. That's also one sentence. Um, I don't think there's anyone here that would argue that we don't have sole authority. That is in the Constitution, too. However, there are these two countervailing provisions of the Constitution which would be changed. And I think that we all need to think about what this means for the future, that any hyper-partisan and friz frivolous impeachment would be A-OK. -okay. That's kind of what this says. And you might want to think about that Personally, you might want to think about that with respect to the person sitting beside you. But I, I really think this is dangerous. Um, our, our country was founded on a system of checks and balances. We all know that. We remember that from eighth grade, fourth grade, three branches of government. This dramatically affects those checks and balances, and I urge a no vote. I don't think this should be sent to the people. I think we should stick to the Constitution as it was drafted with the checks and balances. Uh, we still have sole power of impeachment. That does not change. And um, I, I think we went way overboard going after an entire branch of government, and this is not necessary. I urge a no vote. The gentleman the first, Dr. Zatesla, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Speaker, uh, as a member of the Judiciary Committee uh, during the time that the impeachment occurred, I am having a tough time recollecting who made a motion to impeach the entire Supreme Court. I recall that we voted individually on every member. And every member was judged by us according to the way the West Virginia Constitution uh, stated that we should judge uh, people to be impeached. There was not a, f a full court, let's just throw all the, all the members of the Supreme Court out and we have one vote. Every member was considered. The evidence for each one was considered. So I, to my colleagues who, who say that we did that, that we, that we just uh, voted to take care of the whole Supreme Court in one fell swoop, that actually did not occur. I don't know, unless I missed something, but I, I really don't think so. Let me just say this. The West Virginia Constitution said that Malfe malfeasance, maladministration was a rule, was a reason for impeachment. Now there was look, the, I, I, my colleagues on both sides of the aisle, th this was an excruciating time for us. None of us liked it. We didn't like coming down here all summer. It wasn't any fun, and I personally didn't like it at all. The problem was there were people who had serious offenses against them. And when you've tried to get to the heart of the matter of what those offenses were, you would ask a question. And every question was, what was the policy of the Supreme Court when we came here? Uh, what was their policy as far as travel expenses? What was their policy as far as, uh, uh, you know, uh, decorating their offices? There were no policies in place. If you are a... a, a branch of government, part of your job is to take care of your branch, to have policies in place that tell you what you can and can't do and how you should go about doing your business. When we found out there were no policies, the, it became clear that that's maladministration. Now, the federal court doesn't doesn't see that as an impeachable offense, but the state of West Virginia does. We were required to act and be as fair as we could, and that's exactly what we did. I think that the Supreme Court 
and this is every member of the Supreme Court, and I don't care what political persuasion they are, have acted actually very well in the, in the aftermath of this. I, I give them credit. I have currently, I, I think they're, they're, uh, they've reacted properly. They have policies in place, and they are doing what they, their budget shows it, actually. I commend them. Uh, and, and that includes the people that were, were not, in, you know, not taken off, off the court. So it has a good ending, but I think this resolution should be passed. And I think we need to take back our, our authority as far as this goes. And I hope it never, ever, ever happens again. I can tell you that. Thank you. The gentleman of third, Dr. Flewhart, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Gentleman Yield. Yes. All right. Let's go through some, some hypos. Let's. <laughs> now, we'll start off. Is high crime defined in statute or in the West Virginia Constitution? Don't believe it is. Okay. So it's not defined. And you mentioned some rules earlier that the Senate abides by. I believe you said two-thirds vote. I uh, apologize if the gentleman, I was saying that in order to adopt this joint resolution, we need two-thirds okay. here. But there's still a process, and we just saw at the federal level, that the Senate goes through and re requires a, a vote greater than just a simple majority. Would Correct. You that? Okay. So, but those rules that the Senate abides by currently, they can be changed, right? I believe the rule, the two-thirds rule is constitutional. But we can change that. At some point, we can go through and have that changed. Correct. Like we're trying with to do the, today. Yes, that's what we would do with this. Okay. So... Uh, under that theory, that these rules can be changed, that we could go to, a, say, a simple majority. If, um, if an official right now was impeached solely because of their party, because it was considered a high crime to be of the opposing party, which I'm sure a few of you would like to do that to me right now. So, you know, if you had that opportunity and a high crime was just simply being at the opposing party, what remedy would that government official have if they were impeached? If they were impeached, yeah, they would for being an opposing party. Uh, they would have no r political remedy. No remedy. So, not before this body. Well, not before the court either. Uh, not as to the impeachment proceeding. No. Okay. And at the Washington, you gave the Washington example, so let's walk through that real quick. Now, the remedy was available, and not only available, it was used. But the Supreme Court just declined to take action. That's a fair assessment, isn't it? The most recent impeachment proceeding. I don't. I, I think. What remedy are you speaking of? Going to the Supreme Court while the impeachment proceeding was taking. What place. was the writ? I believe they went to the Supreme Court to try to stop it from happening. It was an attempt to go to the Supreme Court while the impeachment proceedings were occurring, because this legislation, well, not legislation, this um, resolution, states that you cannot intervene. The point being, the Supreme Court, whether it be here or what happened in Washington. We're taking away the ability for them to intervene while it's ongoing, while it's live and running, the impeachment process. Yes, I actually think that you've nailed the point on the head of the necessity of this House Joint Resolution in that the substitute course decided to intervene, which we feel was emphatically wrong. And the Supreme Court chose to restrain themselves, which I would submit to you was probably correct. But the remedy was available, whether you're the governor or an elected official in the legislature being impeached. I believe you can submit a writ for probably, I mean, anybody can go walk over and submit some sort of remedy. This it doesn't mean. The, the language explicitly says, we can pull it up and go through it, but the language explicitly includes a term which says, no court of this state has any authority or jurisdiction by writ or otherwise, that, that, that's the writ you're talking about to intercede or intervene in. My point is, we had the impeachment process. We were down here, you talked about it all summer. I was part of it, and I'm actually cited in the workman opinion, and as is the gentlelady from the 51st, saying that we, we were screwing this up, and they agreed with me. But beyond that, a remedy was available at the time the impeachment process was taking place with the court. We're taking away that now. I think we're telling the court that it may not take it up, yes. Okay, thank you. Very quickly. Uh, Mr. Speaker. The chairman is recognized. So I think we're jumping the gun here because the hypos we went over, what could happen later on is certainly possible. 
we have, we could have a new up and coming young governor. Maybe it's the gentleman from the 35th one day. And you could have a legislature comprised of the opposing party who gets a little greedy and wants to take action against the government official, changes their own rules, and then decides to do whatever they want. And that's dangerous. We all know that power should, be, should have a check and a balance. That's our system. We're taking away that. We're saying that we are superior, that we're infallible, and we don't screw up. Well, the evidence is that we have before, recently. And we're, we're so offended by it, we've got to come in here and change the Constitution. That's not good government. We have to have checks and balances. That's the foundation of our system. And uh, I just cannot support something that just erodes our Constitution, erodes what we're supposed to do down here, and the policy and, and good government taking place. So I'll be voting no. The gentleman from the 30th, Doug Bates, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Would the chairman yield for just one more question? Yes. Uh, my understanding of this is that um, if it uh, shall pass, it would then go to the people. Is that correct? Gentleman's if adopted by the Senate, the gentleman's yeah. correct. And then it would be placed on the ballot. And would be placed on the ballot when? Uh, it would be the next election cycle. So would that, that would be the, the upcoming primary or the... the it should stand by, please. Thank you. Yeah, so if the gentleman would go to page one on line 11, then it's towards the end of that line, it's the next general election to be held in the year 2022, so it'd be I'm the sorry, general. The next general election. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The gentleman of the 29th, Dr. Steele, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We're talking so much about the Constitution today and what's constitutional and what's not constitutional. And it's important to remember some of the powers designated to this body that are not designated to any other body. The only body that has the ability to impeach anybody, to impeach any government official, is this House. This House is where it all begins. How can another body have dictatorial control over the rules in which this body arrives at that conclusion. It's only the hundred people in here that could begin an impeachment process. How could another branch of government hand us the rules for how we are to operate something that only we can operate? It's up to us to go by those rules. What we saw out of the Workman versus Carmichael decision, and it's fine for us to say, and I think it's a pra the place for us to say, was a travesty. It was a travesty. I think it was one of the most unethical things that I ever saw in my life that a sitting person subject to impeachment by a co-equal and separate branch of government would issue a self-serving decision, a self-serving decision to prolong and promote their own political franchise. That's all that decision was. It, it is atrocious. And I think it will stand in the history of not only this state, but the United States of America as, again, a black eye on the judiciary for a judicial branch to look at a legislative branch, ignore the constitutional mandates, ignore the constitutional requirements and say, uh, you just don't get to exercise your power. One of the themes coming into this, this session was the legislature maintaining their role in a co-equal branch of government. This bill does not usurp the power of a co-equal branch. This bill clarifies and reasserts through the people. You know, we, we can pass this today. The Senate can pass it. The governor can sign it. It's still going on to the people where the people are going to have to say there has to be one independent body that can decide whether or not a government official can be removed and no other body can tell them how to do it. That's not us making a political move. That's not people in a supermajority trying to get rid of a political opponent. This is this House maintaining its role in rooting out and removing corruption 
from our government. It, it is our role. It is, it, is, it is what we fundamentally do. And I think it is, it is myopic for us to sit back and try to agree with a self-serving decision that comes from a court that itself was impeached. How could I deliver, if I were in criminal court, how could I sit in the, in the defense chair and deliver my own verdict and deliver my own appeal? That was the most ridiculous thing anyone in American jurisprudence had ever saw was the defendant delivering the verdict on their own appeal. And this fixes that, and that's why I'm going to vote for it today, so that we can carry on the theme that we said we were going to do when we got here, and that's reestablish the role of the legislature as a co-equal branch of government. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The gentleman of 37, Dr. Pushkin, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I guess as we're celebrating uh, History Day here in the West Virginia House of Delegates while we're uh, uh, relitigating both the teacher strike and now the impeachment of the Supreme Court from several years ago, I figured I would, I would give a different take on it, how I remember it happening from the seat that I had, which uh, I believe is now uh, occupied uh, next to where the gentleman from the 35th used to sit back there uh, near the back corner. And um, I remember it a little bit differently. I remember at first when we first heard news about um, outrageous spending going on over on the East Wing, over in the Supreme Court, uh, that uh, one particular justice uh, felt the need to go on a, 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 a media tour and lie about it and blame other people. And there was an article, one article of impeachment actually that I introduced about one Supreme Court justice, not because, not for maladministration, which is a very, very wide uh, allegation. If you want to talk, we can talk about maladministration here in a second, um, but because of basic corruption, lying, cheating, stealing. Lying about the spending, blaming it on somebody else, and taking home a desk. Uh, that's what the, uh, the article of impeachment that I introduced uh, was about. Of course, it was met with a little bit of ridicule. I got over it, uh, but I was, it was laughed at how outrageous to uh, introduce articles of impeachment against Alan Lawfrey. Um, that's not the articles of impeachment we went with. We wound up going a little bit further, just a little bit further, and impeaching the entire court for maladministration. Well, we can do that. You're right. This is the, it's the power of the legislature to have sole power of impeachment. But you still have to follow the rules in anything. And the only you know, arbiter of who's following the rules in the legislature, the only uh, body, the only uh, branch of government that has that kind of check over the legislature is the court. The court gets to interpret what we do. And they interpreted what we did as we didn't follow our, our own rules. It was clear to many of us who were in the room, and we even brought it to, to your attention, Mr. Speaker, we weren't following our own rules. And we were told that ship has sailed. It went back to the Senate. We didn't bundle the articles back up correctly. I, however we did it, we didn't give them their due process. That was the issue. We could have fixed it. We chose not to. So it seems to me now that this is a, uh, a resolution based on some people didn't like the, uh, the outcome that they got, and we're now reliving it again several years later, and we're going to send it back to the people who I, I unfortunately think will probably be less worked up over it than some of us are when they go to vote uh, yay or nay on it at the polls in a couple years. Um, but that's what we're doing today. But I would just advise everybody to tread lightly um, because when uh, maladministration and uh, impeachment has been used, uh, especially impeachment has been used way more often in recent history than it ever was in history and can be used as a political weapon, uh, we should be careful especially when we're talking about maladministration, which is uh, so hard to define. You know, spending too much money, maladministration, taking federal relief dollars, putting it in a bucket, not spending it the way you're supposed to spend it, could be maladministration. You know, $600 million can buy you a lot of couches. That could be maladministration. 
uh, signing West Virginia on to a frivolous lawsuit in four other states trying to suppress votes. That could be considered maladministration. So uh, I say we'd be careful with this, and maybe we should follow our own rules. Well, I'm going to vote against this. I guess the people will probably get a chance to decide here in a few years. The lady from the 35th, Doug Young, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Will the chairman yield just for a quick point of clarification? Yes. Can you just tell me what it would say, if this were to pass, what the ballot would look like so we know what our constituents, what it would say exactly? It's my understanding to the lady, uh, to the best that I can do, that it would have essentially the new language. It would probably have the, now I'm not positive on this because we would have to check with the, probably the Secretary of State to see how exactly it's going to look on the ballot. But uh, my understanding, uh, based on constitutional amendments that I've seen before on the ballot, that it would have the whole of the constitutional uh, section here. So probably section nine, if I had to guess. So pretty much the, the whole bill or with, where there are with, any changes? Yeah, with probably, I assume, attention drawn to the new language. Okay, because I know the last one that was on the ballot was just like one sentence that was kind of confusing, and I think it was Amendment 1. So would this one be, call, be called Amendment 2? Would it have a new name? I, I, can't, I, I wouldn't want to speculate to the lady. Okay, would we have a chance to vote on that, or who makes those decisions? Uh, the, it's my understanding, and I defer to the chair, that the amendment stage is passed, but uh, the lady can always ask for unanimous consent. Oh, sure. I don't want to change it. I just want to know what we're voting on and if that, if what we're voting on today is what would be on the ballot or that is subject to change. You're correct. Okay. Thank you. Are there other, mem are there other members who wish to be recognized on the resolution? The gentleman 36, Doug Rowe, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I, I know this is a, a personal and difficult topic for a number of us, but I think that we need to correct the record in this room. The court, the Supreme Court, appointed judges who, are, who were, I believe were circuit judges, fully qualified to sit on the Supreme Court, as they do in any case. And when they did it, because of the number of judges who were involved in the impeachment, they appointed an entire group, and it's been called a substitute court. That is not correct. That was the Supreme Court of West Virginia. The Supreme Court of Appeals of West Virginia had judges who were a part of the judiciary in West Virginia, and they sat as members of the Supreme Court. And it's important to note that when they did that, they acted ethically, they acted as they do in every case when there is a judge who is disqualified from a matter. It's in this case was unusual because all of the judges were disqualified from the matter. And so the Supreme Court, being a branch of government, not a bunch of individuals who are trying to advance their political careers, but a branch of government, used their usual procedures to have me members of the court appointed to hear the case. And when the case was decided, they didn't say, oh, we're going to protect the political careers of some of the judges that you've impeached. They said very clearly that we are not deciding the merits. We're just telling you that you didn't use your own rules. And there was nothing that I'm aware of that I can remember that the or in, in the order that the judges said you can't fix it. We could have fixed it. It got taken care of with, two, with several resignations and, and, and different matters, and so we didn't need to fix it. But it's very clear that the Supreme Court was who was, uh, who was that court that made that decision. And I know that one of my circuit judges, Judge Bloom, was on that court, and he would resent greatly being accused of, of, of protecting anybody's personal or self-interest. He was on that court to be a judge for the Supreme Court and to participate to make the Supreme Court work in an unusual situation. So I think that that record here in this body needs to be corrected and understood by all the members very clearly that the people who were on that court were properly put on that court and established procedures used by the court in order to make sure that the Supreme Court of West Virginia can function and operate as the Constitution requires. 
So, Mr. Speaker, I would again say that it's very important that we vote down this resolution and that we leave the matters uh, as they are in our Constitution. And next time, if we do it, we just need to do it right. Does the gentleman of the 35th Lake of Capito wish to close debate on the resolution? Yes, Mr. Speaker. Thank you. To the gentleman and my friend from the 36th, uh, if, if I may have inserted some snark in my comment that it was a substitute court, I do apologize, but I inserted it for the purposes of context so the body may understand that it wasn't the very judges that were impeached that were reviewing the issue of the day. It was rather judges that were appropriately and properly appointed to the bench to review the matter. I think the question becomes, for us, is once a court intervenes in a process, where does that stop? Most of us know the importance of precedential value. Marbury versus Madison tells us it's emphatically the province of the judicial department to say what the law is. And I think this body showed great restraint and great respect for not coming right back to Charleston to issue different articles of impeachment. I think the members of this body recognized that it was a painful time for West Virginia. I think we didn't want to put our citizens and our government through that process again. Let's just let it go. Let's begin to heal. So I would submit to you that we took the high road. We'll fix it when the time comes, but we took the high road. Again, I rise today, unfortunately, I, I don't think what we're doing today should be required of us, but I do think it's necessary. And the lady from the 51st and the gentleman from the 36th, I think, kind of prove the point that I rise to make today, which, as, which is that, I believe, I don't want to quote out of context, we can check the record, but was that they weren't invalidating our decision. They were just telling us, basically, we shouldn't impeach the Supreme Court. Nobody gets to tell us that. Now, what I would submit to you is they found a loophole and a way to get out of it. It was crafty, smart, definitely qualified people to the gentleman from the 36th. And to rebut other assertions that these were somehow bundled together and shoved through, I specifically recall taking them in turn one by one, and there was a final article of impeachment that was adopted that did encapsulate more than one justice. But we did take each one of those in turn for the record. And I agree with the lady from the 51st. I agree to the plain meaning of the Constitution, in fact. And I agree with the gentleman from the 37th that we should tread lightly. Again, I don't even think we should be here. I think it's just a mistake that we're correcting. And the lady from the 51st mentioned the plain reading, and I'll read it, Article 9 of the Constitution. The House of Delegates shall have the sole power of impeachment. In Nixon versus the United States, Justice Rehnquist clarified what sole mean. He took the plain definition, meaning solitary. The Web, excuse me, the Webster's Dictionary, uh, defining it as having no companion, solitary, being the only one. And functioning independently and without assistance or interference. If the courts may review the actions of the Senate in order to determine whether that body tried an impeached official, it is difficult to see how the Senate would be functioning independently and without assistance or interference. We respect the separation of powers Many times, decisions that are made by our Supreme Court, they're last because they're, excuse, they're not last because they're right. They're right because they're last. Well, I would submit to you that our decision in impeachment may be right to some, it may be wrong to some, but it's right because it's last. And there are prophylactic measures in place through our Constitution that ensure that we're not some runaway government. It requires a majority of this body to adopt articles of impeachment and to pass them down the hallway to our friends to the Senate, where it requires a two-thirds majority to convict, same as it does on the federal level. Those are prophylactic measures that the founders put in place. I don't sit here and project myself to be any brighter than them, but those seem to be 
the purposes of those restrictions. And again, we respected their decision, and so we come here today. And I would submit uh, to my good friend from the third that said, well, if we think something was wrong, we can come in here and we can change the Constitution. Yes, we can. Yes, we can. But the voters have to approve it. But if we do something wrong, what's the check on us? Ladies and gentlemen, the check on us are the people of West Virginia. And we go before them every two years. And if they don't like the decision, they can send us home. I urge adoption of the resolution. The question before the House is, shall the resolution be adopted? Those in favor of adoption will vote aye. Those opposed will vote no. The clerk will prepare the machine. Has every member voted? If so, the clerk will close the machine and ascertain the result. On that question, there were 78 ayes, 21 nays, and one member absent not voting. Two-thirds of members elected having voted in the affirmative. The chair declares the resolution adopted. Clerk will please report the title of the resolution. House Joint Resolution 2, providing that courts have no authority or jurisdiction to intercede or intervene in or interfere with any impeachment proceedings of the House of Delegates or the Senate. Are there amendments to the title? If not, the title as read by the clerk will be and remain the title of the resolution. The clerk will please report the actions of the House to the Senate. Are there further items on third reading? If not, bills on second reading. Committee substitute for House Bill 2002 relating to broadband. Are there amendments? The Committee on Infrastructure and Technology moves to amend the bill. It's HT and I AM 2-26. Are there amendments to the amendment? Delegate Linville moves to amend the amendment. It's HFA Linville 3-2, number one, amended. Are there objections to having the secondary amendment explained in lieu of having it read? There are no objections. The gentleman from the 16th, Doug at Linville, was recognized to explain the secondary amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The uh, secondary amendment before you simply strikes out two words um, on page 25, section 21, line 9, specifically saying uh, that we would remove the words cable or. Uh, this was a request by the Public Service Commission to ensure that we didn't inadvertently uh, create a twofold um, uh, system for, for dispute resolution um, and, and clarifies that we are handing um, disputes for broadband uh, service uh, resolution to the state's Attorney General Consumer Advocate Division. Um, I reserve the right to close if necessary, but I urge adoption. The question before the House is the secondary amendment, as just explained by the gentleman the 16th. Are there members who wish to speak to the secondary amendment? If not, those in favor of the secondary amendment will please say aye. Aye. Those opposed will please say no. The ayes have the chair declares the secondary amendment adopted. The question now before the House is the primary amendment as amended. Are there objections to having the primary amendment explained in lieu of having it read? Huh. Is there another secondary amendment? Delegate Fleischauer moves to amend the amendment. This is HFA Fleischauer 3-2. Are there objections to having the amendment explained in lieu of having it read? Lady in the 51st, Delegate Fleischauer. Um, I wish to withdraw my amendment. If lady wishes to withdraw the amendment, are there objections? Chair, here's no objections. The secondary amendment is withdrawn. The question now is on the primary amendment as amended. Are there objections to having the primary amendment explained in lieu of having it read? The chair, here's no objection. The gentleman the 16th, Doug at Linville, to explain the primary amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. What you have before you um, and to the body uh, is a strike and insert amendment, um, which, uh, which does several things. Um, First, uh, it incorporates a series of modifications that were sought by the Division of Highways um, to make the in-kind compensation set up in the bill um, slightly, um, slightly uh, uh, simpler um, and would treat broadband as it were any other utility. Um, this removes a great deal of language from the bill and simplifies its ap applicability to a, to a fairly marked degree. It also uh, provides uh, the provisions of, of, of the article shall apply to all installations of any kind which necessitate disturbance of ground for a length of 1,000 feet or greater in a right-of-way owned or controlled by the Division of Highways. Uh, that uh, makes Dig 1 significantly more um, applicable. It redefines a reasonable distance for a cable provider in FCC orders um, to 1,000 feet uh, for the distance they would have to give a free uh, cable drop to a school. Importantly, uh, that is FCC practice and follows FCC orders, and so we're just making that, uh, making that code revision to mirror the FCC. Uh, it removes language placing the Broadband Enhancement Council underneath the Office of Broadband, but directs it to coordinate with the new Office of Broadband. 
Uh, it restores language relating to the National Electric Safety Code, the ability of the Broadband Enhancement Council to retain consultants, um, and makes experts hired by the Office of Broadband available to the Broadband Enhancement Council where funds are available. Um, uh, additionally, several of the floor amendments which were, which were offered are incorporated. Um, these provide that a cable or broadband system operator shall provide subscribers 30 days advanced written notice of any changes to rates or charges, including the expiration of any promotion um, or special pricing, um, and provides that, um, that subscribers can uh, reach out to the State Attorney General's Office Consumer Advocate Division uh, for assistance. Um, We've incorporated uh, the uh, amendment offered by Delegate Kimball and myself um, for um, uh, clarifying the, the, um, uh, the preemption of homeowners associations um, or any other municipality um, that is only forward looking and not past looking um, and uh, you know, several other changes. Um, it's a very good amendment. Um, additional language is, is provided relating to Office of Broadband dealing with the goal of providing digital equal, uh, equality of opportunity. Um, this is a forward-looking um, uh, code modification which seeks to bring us in line with what we think that the Congress of the United States will likely do and adds additional uh, reporting requirements uh, to the bill. Uh, finally, uh, there is created in the Office of Broadband a duty to report to the G Attorney General Consumer Protection Division if in analyzing the data that we have that it appears that, uh, that uh, speed tests in a certain uh, two square miles or so um, are not uh, uh, reaching at least the lowest level of speed that was, that was sold by a, by a provider a certain amount of the time. And, the, in, and the, the concern for that actually goes all the way back to the 2015 um, Frontier uh, uh, settlement that the Attorney General was able to reach wherein um, Frontier was unable to provide the speeds that they were selling to consumers. Uh, it's a very good amendment. Mr. Speaker, I urge adoption. I'm here to answer any questions, um, and I reserve the right to close as necessary. The question before the House is the primary amendment as just explained by the gentleman of the 16th. Are there members who wish to speak to the primary amendment? If not, those in favor of adoption of the primary amendment will say aye. Those opposed will say no. no. Ayes appear to have it. The ayes have it. Chair declares the primary amendment adopted. Are there further amendments? Mm -hmm. If not, the bill will be advanced to third reading. Next bill on second reading. Committee substitute for House Bill 2024, expand use of telemedicine to all medical personnel. Are there amendments? Delegate Rowe moves to amend the bill. This is HFA Rowe 3-2. Does the gentleman wish to explain the amendment in lieu of having it read? Yes, Mr. Speaker. Are there objections? Speaker, there are no objections. The gentleman is recognized. This is really a, a cleanup amendment. It doesn't change the policy of the bill. What the, the uh, provision says is that the out-of-state provider will be subject to the same rules and regulations that anybody in-state is, is, is being as a provider. And what this does is to use the magic word jurisdiction of state courts, uh, simple, simple addition to make it clear that they are accepting by being a teleprovider that they're accepting the jurisdiction of state courts over their practice that's performed in West Virginia, even though they never crossed the state line. The second thing the amendment does is that it makes it clear, you always wonder when you, when you have a, an out-of-state person, how does the Board of Medicine enforce its rules and regulations on somebody out-of-state that's never walked into West Virginia? Well, this makes it clear, as we do in all cases, this is standard procedure. Uh, we do it for corporations and, and for out-of-state motor vehicle drivers. It just says that service of process would be on the Secretary of State. Uh, it's a simple amendment, and I encourage the members to adopt it. But thank you. Questions on the primary amendment. The gentleman 28th, Doug Pack, is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Inquiry of the chair. Gentleman may state the <clears throat> question. Um, the amendment, as in the system, indicates that uh, the gentleman wishes to amend the committee substitute for House Bill 2024 on page four. But on in the system, on page four is merely the explanation of the bill at the end. So I'm, I'm merely inquiring whether or not the amendment is properly formatted. Chair, I'll consult the clerk. <clears throat> the lines are right, but the rest of it's right.
Uh, the gentleman's inquiry, to the extent it constitutes a point of order, is well taken. The amendment should read page three rather than page four. The chair is advised by the clerk that the line numbers on the amendment are correct. The page reference should be to page three rather than to page four. Are there objections to that reformation being made by the chair? There are no objections. That reformation is made. Does the gentleman wish to be recognized? Yes, sir. The gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, I, um, I appreciate the gentleman from the 36th Amendment. I think it is a good amendment, and um, I, I certainly meant no offense in, in pointing out that, that perceived error in the, um, in the amendment, but as we've discussed today, we want to do things right. So. Um, I appreciate the reformation and I would encourage adoption of the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Are there other members who wish to speak to the primary amendment? If not, those in favor of adoption of the primary amendment will say aye. aye. Those opposed will say no. Aye. Ayes appear to have it. The ayes have it. Chair declares the primary amendment adopted. Are there other amendments? If not, the bill will be advanced to third reading. Next bill on second reading. Committee substitute for House Bill 2025 provide liquor, wine, and beer licensees with some new concepts developed during the state of emergency, utilizing new technology to provide greater freedom to operate in a safe and responsible manner. Are there amendments? Delegate Steele moves to amend the bill. This is 3 H A M Steele 3 2 number 1. Are there objections to having the amendment explained? Lou, of having it read. Chair, here's no objection. The gentleman the 29th is recognized to explain the amendment. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. What the amendment does is it removes a definition that was added. Um, the amendment begins on page 5 of the bill, the committee substitute, but it runs all the way through page 10. So there is a definition section in here. And in there was added the definition of a light alcoholic beverage, which means any alcoholic beverage containing not more than 15% alcohol by volume obtained by distillation mixed with drinkable water, fruit juices, other alcoholic or non-alcoholic beverages, and or other ingredients in a solution. And the part of this definition left out what it was contained in, and that's become problematic in terms of, of is, is it going to be considered, because this is what this is trying to do is get it to be considered a non-intoxicating beer, and we don't know that it, that's actually right at this point. So what we're trying to do with this amendment is pull that out of there because it might be a little premature and just maintain the integrity of the three-tiered system at this point. So uh, I'd urge adoption of the amendment. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The question is on the primary amendment. Are there amendments to the amendment? If not, are there members who wish to be recognized to speak to the amendment? If not, those in favor of the amendment will say aye. aye. Those opposed will For what purpose of the gentleman the 45th seek recognition? Uh, Mr. Speaker, I don't know if I need to request a rule 49. Yes, the chair has not completed the vote yet, so the chair will recognize the gentleman for, for a, a rule 49 request for the facts as relayed to the chair by the gentleman. Yes, sir. Under the facts as relayed to the chair by the gentleman from the 45th, Doug at Martin, the gentleman from the 45th does belong to a class of not greater than five impacted by this bill. Therefore, it would be the ruling of the chair that the gentleman would be directed not to vote both on this amendment and on the substantive bill. The gentleman is excused from voting. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. For what purpose does the gentleman 29 seek recognition? Mr. Speaker, I, I don't know if I did this with, well, I'm pretty sure I didn't. It is, it is my intent to move at some point that this bill uh, move on to third reading. Should this pass or not pass, doesn't matter to me, uh, with the right to amend on third reading. Uh, I don't know if this is the right time for that. I just didn't want to miss an opportunity. You're Persuasive on. closing. Uh, the question before the House is the primary amendment as explained by the gentleman the 29th. Let's take that first. Are there, are, there member, are there further members who wish to speak? There are not. Those in favor of adoption will say aye. Those opposed will say no. Ayes appear to have it. Ayes have it. Chair declares the primary amendment adopted. Now, gentlemen, the 29th. Uh, yes, Mr. Speaker. I'd ask unanimous consent that the bill move to third reading with the uh, right to for additional amendments. Are there objections? Chair, here's no objections. The bill will be so advanced with the right for offer additional amendments on third reading. 
Next bill on second reading. Committee substitute for House Bill 2093 relating to exemptions for the United States Department of Veterans Affairs Medical Foster Homes. Are there amendments? If not, the bill will be advanced. House Bill 2791 relating to enrollment and costs of homeschooled or private schooled students at vocational schools. Are there amendments? Delegate Walker moves to amend the bill. This is HFA Walker 3-2. Does the lady wish to explain the amendment Louis having read? The lady is, are there objections? There are no objections. The lady from the 51st is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. We all know that I'm a homeschool parent. And you already know that I strongly stand for diversity, inclusion, and equity. So I went back and I spoke to my county, and I spoke to the special ed department, and I spoke to our vocational um, tech school that we have, and I also spoke to a whole bunch of homeschool groups. So what this amendment would do it would make sure that our homeschool and our private school students meet the equivalent qualifications required as public school students and disclose if that child in the last year had any attendance issues or any behavior issues. And I did this for one thing. We often speak about homeschool and private school students as if they just miss school, they don't want to do anything, and they have bad behaviors. That is not the case with my son that I homeschool and other students. We keep saying that we want to do things the right way. This is one way of doing things the right way. Now, I understand that I was probably in a thread that I shouldn't have been in. And there are some folks that will not support this amendment. But what I don't want to give is false hope to a student. Because even if that student needs an IEP, that's going to take time if they're not in the public school system. Even if that student had a discipline action against them, whether it was a suspension, and there are, that student should have had a safe schools hearing, but that parent chose to homeschool, I don't want this student to get their hopes up and then start this process and be surprised or shocked. We also know, especially in the homeschool community, homeschool students are an afterthought. If it's right, it's last, like the delegate from the 35th said. And if it's last, it's right. So what this amendment is also asking is that at least annually, we notify homeschool students that they can qualify and take courses in a public vocational setting. I urge adoption of this amendment so we can make sure that we have equity of all students, no matter their choice of educating and pursuing their education. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The question is on the primary amendment. The gentleman from the 27th Delegate Ellington is recognized. Yes, Mr. Speaker, may I speak to the amendment? The gentleman is recognized. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, although the, the lady may have good intentions with this amendment, there are concerns about it, and I'd like to, to point that out. Uh, to understand what this amendment does to the bill, you need to recall what the bill technically says. The bill pretty much just says that a homeschool student, private or parochial, can go into a vocational uh, school under the same conditions that the public school students can. The concern was that they were, some were being charged the adult fee. They already, the school already see, receives the, the, uh, the, uh, the school uh, allotment for that student anyway. So there was an unfair practice in that point and this bill was trying just to correct that. So the bill was made nice and simple just to say that they are charged the same way as a regular student, if there's any additional cost, they have to pay the additional costs. What this amendment does, though, is says that they would have to abide by, uh, they'd have to go with uh, any, um, quite, let's see, says disciplinary or absentee issues and stuff, they already have to abide by the same rules any student that would be taking those vocational course, courses would do. 
They have to do the same eligibility and the same behavior when they're in there. So this is a little du duplicative and probably not necessary. The current system of notification already seems to be working. This amendment says they have to annually notify all the homeschool students. It leaves out the private school or parochial school students. So the thing is with the bill, this bill was previously vetoed by the governor because several parts of it were duplicative in the bill with already existing code. So this bill was made simple just to exclude the extra fees. So by changing this and adding this amendment to it, my concern is that this language would also be duplicative and make it possible that it could be vetoed again. So for those reasons, I would urge rejection of this amendment, even though it has good intentions, but don't want to uh, lose the bill on that. Are there other members who wish to speak to the primary amendment? If not, the question before the House is the primary amendment as explained by the lady from the 51st, Dougat Walker. Those in favor of the amendment will say aye. aye. Those opposed will say no. No. No spirit to have it. No saboteur declares. Are there are further amendments. If not, the bill will be advanced to third reading. Bills on first reading. If not, leaves of absence. Lady from the 49th. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, for our colleague, Delegate Westfall. Are there objections to a leave of absence being granted? The gentleman 36, Dougat Pritt, for what purpose does the gentleman seek recognition? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I would request that the comments from the delegate from the 35th explaining joint resolution to be included in the appendix of the journal. Okay, are there objections to that? There are no objections. The question is still on the lady's motion or the lady's unanimous request that a leave of absence be granted to the gentleman of the 13th, Doug at Westfall. Are there objections? There are no objections. Leave of absence shall be granted. Miscellaneous business? If not, lady from the 49th. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I move subject to announcements. The House adjourn until 11 a.m. Wednesday, March 3rd. The question before the House is the motion by the lady from the 49th that subject to announcements, the House stand adjourns at 11 a.m. tomorrow. Are there announcements? The gentleman of the 48th, Duggan Hamry. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Just as a reminder to members, uh, remarks by members will be held tomorrow at 5 p.m. here in the House chamber. Those that wish to speak will be allotted five minutes to speak. Lady in the 49th, Duggan Summers. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Your Committee on Rules will meet at 1045 tomorrow morning in the House Judiciary Committee Room. The gentleman of the 25th, Doug Painter. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Your Committee on Agronet Resources will meet at 8 a.m. Wednesday morning in the House Government Organization Committee Room. The agenda has been posted. The gentleman of the 32nd, Doug Fast. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Your Committee on Judiciary will meet today at 2 p.m. Government Organization Room, 2 p.m. The agenda has been posted. Gentleman 35th, Dr. Capito. Thank you very much, Mr. Speaker. Two announcements. First, for members of the Committee on the Judiciary, there is uh, lunch provided upstairs in our committee room, in the House Judiciary Committee Room. Second announcement uh, for the entire body and the public. There will be a virtual public hearing on this Thursday, March 4th, at 8 a.m. in the uh, House Government Organizations Room. That's where the members will be, similar to how we did it on Monday. It is on, the subject is Senate Bill 275, relating generally to the West Virginia Appellate Reorganization Act of 2021. For the public, to register to speak during the public hearing, please call the House Judiciary Committee office at 304-340-3252 between the hours of 3 p.m. and 4 p.m. today, Tuesday, March the 2nd. Be prepared to provide your name, email address, and the entity that you represent and whether you support or oppose the legislation. All of these details can be found on the West Virginia Legislature website through the link to the Committee on the Judiciary's sublink to our website. So all that information that I just listed is on there. Uh, again, that's on Thursday at 8 a.m. Thank you very much. Jim the 16th, Doug Linville. 
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Your Committee on Technology and Infrastructure will meet tomorrow at 3 p.m. in the House Chamber. Please bring your laptops because the Committee on Technology and Infrastructure should utilize technology, and the agenda has been posted. The gentleman of the 54th, Doug Hott. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Your Committee on Banking and Insurance will meet tomorrow, March the 3rd at 9 a.m. here in the Chamber. The agenda has been posted. The gentleman of the 31st, Doug Tony. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Your Committee on Veterans Affairs and Homeland Security will meet tomorrow, March the 3rd at 3 p.m. in the House Government Organization Room. The agenda has been posted. Lady in the 52nd, Doug Seipol. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Your Committee on Seniors, Children, and Family Issues will meet at 1 o'clock Wednesday afternoon in the House Government Organization Committee Room, and please bring your computer your computer and the agenda has been posted. The gentleman the 16th, Dr. Mant. Mr. Speaker, thank you. Uh, your Committee on Small Business Entrepreneurship will meet tomorrow in the Government Organization Room at 10 a.m. The uh, agenda has been posted. Thank you. The gentleman the 63rd, Dr. Hardy. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Your Committee on Political Subs will meet tomorrow at 2 o'clock in the House Chamber. The gentleman of the 15th, Dr. Foster. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. The Committee on Government Organization will meet today at 4 p.m. in the House Government Organization Committee Room. The agenda is posted. The gentleman of the 22nd, Dr. Jeffries. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Your Committee on Fire and EMS will meet tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. in the House Government Organization Room. The agenda will be posted. The gentleman of the 27th, Dr. Gearhart. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Your Committee on Pensions and Retirement will meet at 10 a.m. Wednesday morning in the House Finance Committee room. The agenda has been posted. The gentleman the seventh, Dr. Barnhart. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Your Committee on Workforce Development will not meet tomorrow, and uh, subject to announcement, we'll probably meet next week and uh, have some things on the agenda. So thank you, Mr. Speaker. The lady from the 38th, Doug Graves. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Um, Republicans will caucus 15 minutes after we're finished here today here in the House Chamber. So that's House Republicans. We will caucus 15 minutes after we're done. Chairman the 44th, Dr. Hanna. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Your Committee on Prevention and Treatment of Substance Abuse will meet tomorrow at 2 p.m. in the Government Organization Room. The agenda will be posted. The Chairman the 13th, Dr. Higginbotham. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Your Committee on Education will be meeting today at 2 p.m. here in the House of Delegates Chamber. Education today at 2. The gentleman the third, Dr. Fluharty. Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Democrats will caucus in 10 minutes in House Gov Org. Are there further announcements? If not, the question is on the motion that the House stand adjourned at 11 a.m. tomorrow. Those in favor, please say aye. Those opposed, please say no. The ayes have it. The motion is adopted. The House is adjourned at 11 a.m. tomorrow. Hello, everyone. Uh, I appreciate you being with me today. It's Tuesday, and uh, you know it's the early days of March, I, and it's all running together for me right now. But I think it's March the second, and uh, and anyway, welcome. And and uh, I'm here. I'm here for one thing and one thing only today, and that is to try to continue to answer, answer your questions to the very best of my ability. I've got our Secretary of Revenue, uh, Dave Hardy, with me, and. Uh, and he, you know, he's going to sub in for me on some different items as they come up, I'm sure. But, uh, but I'm going to try to answer the, the lion's share of everything I possibly can, and I'm going to try to, try to tell you with all in me just uh, the strategy of what we're trying to do. You know, I go back to just this, and I want you to pay close, close attention to just this. In my state of the state, it would have been so easy so, so easy to just uh, to have done an incredible victory lap and talked about all the successes and everything that's happening in West Virginia. 